arguably one of the finest military jets Britain has ever produced, the Blackburn Buccaneer can still be seen in working order thanks to organisations like Cold War Jets at Bruntingthorpe Airfield in Leicestershire, where dedicated volunteers keep British aviation heritage alive. The design of the Buccaneer goes back 50 years, when Blackburn Aircraft won the contract to produce a two-man, ultra-low-level, carrier-borne strike aircraft. Its distinctive curves are due to something called the Area Rule Principle, which produces maximum stability with minimum drag at transonic speeds, just below the sound barrier. Another advanced feature was boundary layer control, where air from the engines was redirected over wings and flaps and under the tailplane to reduce the stalling speed, allowing for a slower approach for those critical deck landings. Well, the Buccaneer was first designed to deliver nuclear weapons uh, against Sverdlov-class cruisers of the Soviet Navy in what was called a long toss manoeuvre, whereby you would run in very fast at low level and then pitch the aircraft up into a pre-calculated toss manoeuvre. The bomb would be released, uh, fly forward through the air, the aircraft would carry out an escape manoeuvre and disappear in the opposite direction to escape the effects of the blast and the detonation. It was very effective because uh, unlike operating over land, uh, we could plan our routes so that we didn't fly over any kind of enemy territory, other enemy surface ships. So really, the first that uh, a target would know it was under attack was when four, six, or in later days, eight buccaneers would break the enemy ship's radar horizon, as I say, three minutes away, and then this coordinated attack would go in. So unless the ship was already at action stations, it had little chance of combating uh, a surprise attack of that nature. And all our tactics were built around surprise, firepower, saturation, and coordination. This innovative revolving bomb bay, designed to reduce drag, was capable of carrying not only a nuclear bomb, but a constantly evolving range of conventional weapons. It could also be fitted with reconnaissance equipment. Without doubt, the, the best part of flying the Buccaneer was flying from the deck by day. Uh, once you got used to it, that was the, the best piece of pure flying that I have ever done. 100 feet, uh, 400 to 550 knots, absolutely rock steady and stable. And of course, although we weren't supposed to fly below 100 feet, it was quite possible to do so every now and again. You really had to be on top of the aircraft at the whole time, but it, it just had this fantastic character to it, and we, we all really loved it. The whole concept of operating the Buccaneer was you were very much a team, a crew. Uh, so choosing your navigator or observer, if you were in the fleet air arm, was a, was a vital business. You had to get on well together. We would strike up very close, professional working relationships with each other. And in my view, that was one of the great strengths of the aeroplane, and in particular, the effectiveness of its operational capability, the two-man crew, which I think was taken to the, to the ultimate with the Buccaneer. As the carrier fleet declined, the RAF supported the Navy with buccaneers of its own. Although initially not the aircraft of choice for the Air Force establishment, such was the capability of the buccaneer that it was to prove itself an RAF classic. There was no other aircraft that could actually do the sort of jobs that the buccaneer did, particularly the maritime attack role, where it had extremely good range, a very good weapon system, particularly towards the end with the Seagull sea skimming missile. The Buccaneer even took part in red flag exercises held by the US at Nellis Air Force Base, where air combat skills are tested to the limit. The Buccaneer went out to red flag, I think, for the first time in 1977 or 1978. Uh, the Americans had never seen this aeroplane before. Uh, they went out uh, to Nellis and operated over the desert at extremely low levels, down to 100 feet or so. The Americans had never really operated down that low. The first impression uh, when we arrived was that the Americans in particular, the aggressor squad, didn't have a great deal of knowledge of what our capabilities were. And it came as a very big surprise to them to find that, first of all, we could fly very long distances, we could maintain very high speed for a long time. 
but in particular we flew lower than anything they'd ever seen before and uh, that was our fundamental tactic. It was interesting that whatever they tried uh, by way of interception with all the assistance they were given by AWACS aircraft and the like, they didn't get one single kill against a buccaneer in those early red flags in the whole of the two weeks we were out there. I have only flown uh, the Hunter, the Hawk and the Phantom as equivalent type aeroplanes and the Buccaneer had by far the best ride at high speed and low level of any of those aircraft. And that regime is absolutely beautiful. It was uh, very stable, very, very comfortable and in many ways it gave you a feeling of invincibility. I must quote a colleague of mine, when you flew a Buccaneer, especially at low level, you really felt as if you could go out and ram something. I mean, you got this impression that you were flying something that was virtually indestructible. The basic tactic if a fighter jumped us was we all split to the, the four winds or six winds, depending how many aircraft we were, and, and we ran away from each other. One of us may, may get shot down, but there was no fighter in the world that had enough gas to chase us all down. And to shoot something down, flying at 100 feet or 50 feet, as I say in some cases, very, very difficult even for the best fighter pilot. The people that come here to Bruntingthorpe, we are all volunteers and they range from builders, plumbers, there's um, a range of trades here. Um, we do have some XRAF guys as well working with us. Um, and uh, it's, it's open to everybody really. If, if, you, if you want to come along and give us a hand, then please, uh, please do. I've always been interested in the Buccaneer, yeah. Um, it's the last British aeroplane, wholly British aeroplane, um, and I believe that it should be preserved. Seeing decaying old relics lying about doesn't do anything for me at all, but to see them working um, is quite exciting and to be able to maintain and to be able to offer um, a facility for others to maintain these old warbirds in working condition is quite exciting. One of the aircraft that has found a home at Bruntingthorpe is XX894. The Buccaneer holds great significance for its owner, sculptor Guy Hume. His father, Alan, an observer, was sadly killed in a Buccaneer. I went to Lossingmouth in 1965 when my father went to learn to fly the aircraft there and um, I've, I've been associated with it in some way or other ever since. You know, everyone that works on this aircraft that's uh, a member of this team uh, comes here for their own interest and um, their time is free. Uh, spares are hard to come by but one of the, the great advantages of coming to front and thought is that there are a sprinkling of engineers here that, uh, that can talk to each other, there's equipment which we can share, and uh, a Buccaneer is 58 feet long. It needs a natural space, only provided by an airfield like this. It's uh, a glorious piece of machinery. It's all shapes and curves. It's one of the prized jets from the, the Navy's inventory. See it landing on a carrier. It was all very fast moving, and um, those times was you know, happily passed in some respects, but. Uh, it was, it was a glorious part of my childhood, actually. It was a wonderful aircraft, and the tragedy was that uh, a lot of the aircraft's design potential was never, ever properly used because of the Royal Air Force's view that the aircraft was very much a stopgap aeroplane. Well, it entered service with the Royal Air Force in 1969 and stopped the gap until 1994, and incredibly successfully as well. I mean, she was replaced with the Tornado, and with an eye to the replacement coming along, the investment wasn't made in the Buccaneer, although um, some of the test aircraft for the Tornado program were indeed Buccaneers with Tornado avionics, and I believe the pilots who flew those um, really didn't see the need to go any further. This aircraft is very much a, a pilot's aircraft. You have to fly it every moment that you're airborne. With a Tornado, because there's so many computer systems on board, it is actually very simple to fly. Very difficult to operate correctly, but very simple to fly. Nothing like this. This, this is a pilot's love. It was almost like riding a good horse. You know, the, when the horse is having a good time and the horse is comfortable with its rider, the horse lets you know it's happy. The buccaneer almost let you know when she was happy, and she was never happier than going flat out on the deck. When I was OC 237 OCU up at Lossiemouth, my war role was to support tornado aircraft delivering laser guided bombs out in Germany. The only time the Buccaneer has actually been used in combat was using the Pave Spike laser designator pod to designate bombs delivered by tornadoes in the first Gulf War in 1991. And in fact, towards the end of that war, the Buccaneer was able to deliver its own laser-guided bombs, designated by itself. And I think it's true to say that the Buccaneer was the only RAF aircraft to destroy an enemy aircraft on the ground 
uh, during the Gulf War when a laser designated bomb went straight through a, a Cub aircraft taxiing on an Iraqi airfield. We were fortunate to have an airplane that though it had been designed for low level operations performed extremely well at medium level and you could throw her around and you could actually perform some pretty dynamic um, service to air missile evasion maneuvers if you needed to. Uh, and we practiced those and we gained even more confidence in our platform. You never wanted to take incoming fire, but I think there was also an element of the fact that if any airplane was going to bring you back after having a few bits knocked off it, it was a buccaneer. It was a remarkable success in that war, and that, in my view, is testimony to the design, the engineering, and in particular the quality and professionalism of the people that flew it. She's the last of a breed, the last of the all British built aircraft, and, and worthy of such status. Um, probably you couldn't have a more fitting last of the line, if you like, uh, and what a fitting way to conclude her service with, with active operations um, and performing very creditably too. It's the best British airplane ever built, but then I'm biased.